it's my distinct pleasure to, to more formally introduce Dr. Garcia, who is the Frode Jensen Professor of Medicine and Associate Director of the Division of Pulmonary, Allergy, and Critical Care Medicine in the Department of Medicine at Columbia University. She's a true visionary in the field of genetics and pulmonary fibrosis, so I'd like to welcome her to the podium and uh, look forward to her presentation. Thanks, Greg. It's great to be back in Texas. <laughs> I've been eating my fill of barbecue. So it's great. Um, so I was talking with friends the other night about how the first PFF session really had only about 10 to 12 tables, just like this, seating 10 people per table. And what a remarkable change that's happened um, through the PFF. Congratulations, PFF, for really doing a remarkable job at this summit. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing the disease that we're so familiar with, pulmonary fibrosis. And my first comment is it's very complex. This is a very complex disorder. Um, there's over 100 different subtypes. Each of them are incredibly rare. Um, they share a few common characteristics in that they're not cancer, they're not infections, and they have a similar presentation in the terms of the clinical, radiographic, and physiologic features. But after that, they're very different, and it's a different infiltration of inflammatory cells, of fibrotic cells that change the architecture of the lung, leading to scarring of the lung and difficulty breathing. Um, as many cases in medicine, we're really good at picking out the most severe of subtypes, and for uh, pulmonary fibrosis, this classic um, data slide showed that patients with an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia that had a UIP pattern, what we now recognize as IPF, was the, one of the most severe forms of pulmonary fibrosis with a reduced survival and life expectancy. So a lot of the focus has focused on IPF, but this audience knows that basically it encompasses about half of all the different patients with pulmonary fibrosis. And there are some shared features that I'm gonna talk about that go across the different subtypes of pulmonary fibrosis. But for IPF, if we, if we start talking with this one, which we, we know much more about IPF now than when we started this research, we know across multiple epidemiologic studies that its incidence is, is directly related to age. And even though I started my comments by saying how rare a disease it is with approximately five to 20 per 100,000 patients across the age spectrum. If you look at just those that are older individuals, for example, Medicare recipients go to the age of 65, one in 200 individuals in that age group have a diagnosis of IPF. And the data suggests across the US and the UK that that incidence is increasing. And so we know in certain age groups this is not a rare disease, as evidenced really by the rise of uh, interest in this disease. So, so over the years, I think it's fabulous to see over these different conferences how we've gotten better at diagnosing. We're still not perfect. There's still a lag time in diagnosis, but the diagnosing is getting better. And I really think that's due to the, the uh, reliance now on, on expert group multidisciplinary diagnoses at different sites. The PFF has definitely played a role in that, in, um, in helping in difficult cases for those um, patients who don't meet formal guidelines, uh, diagnostic criteria, and really on our reliance more on CT scans. As you've heard, we now have two FDA medications. These are not cures. They slow the progression of disease, and for some patients, they slow it better than others. Lung transplantation is still an option for those with progressive disease. Um, but clearly, we need more because we, as physicians, we see our patients, some of them progressively declining, and we need more. And so that's really where the emphasis of genetics um, um, has been to see if we can understand the disease at its basic roots, can we do more, as we just heard from Dr. Perez. So in terms of the genetics of pulmonary fibrosis, this is not like the genetics of cancer, which is basically a study of somatic variants. This is the study of variants that you were born with. So those that um, you got from your mother and your father. And we can just basically tease apart those genetic variants into two broad categories, rare variants and common variants. The common variants are down in the bottom right portion of the slide. 
These are ones that are basically, it's one variant in one gene. They're variants that are associated with the disease, but they're very common in the population. For example, the odds, so the allele frequency of the most, uh, um, the highest effect size variant in the MUC5B gene um, has very sizable odds ratios, but in the, in the normal population, the allele frequency is 10%. In the disease population, approximately 33%. And so what does that mean? That means if the table fits 10 people, normal people, two out of 10 will have the MUC5B variant. But in a table of all IPF patients, six to seven of them will have the risk variant. So they're statistically associated, um, but it's hard to find, um, predict which of the normal people with the variant will end up with pulmonary fibrosis since it is so rare. In contrast, the rare variants are just that, they're rare. And so our experience with the rare variants and specifically with those that are associated with uh, telomere shortening um, have shown that those variants go across the gene. So the gene is the relevant unit to study and each one is extremely rare. So these variants have not been found in the world's largest databases that encompass over 60,000 people, and yet they're found to co-segregate with disease in the families that they're discovered. And so they are private to that family and they have a lot of meaning to, in the family that has inherited them. Um, and so our, in, our um, information from those discovery papers have, have shown us that the relevant rare variants are extremely rare, that they cause a damage to the protein, specific proteins, um, and that damage leads to a loss of function. And all of them um, can be linked together in the telomere pathway. As a geneticist, I love pedigrees, and I promise I will only show you one here, but it kind of speaks to these points. So when we found, um, when we linked the gene PARN to pulmonary fibrosis, we did that with um, less than 100 individuals from different families. And what we were struck by, even though we knew that these variants that we discovered were extremely large, they were extremely rare, we couldn't find them anywhere else in the world. In our first cohort, we found two individuals representing two different families who had inherited the same extremely rare variant. Uh, the pedigree on the left was one that was taken care of by Dr. Fitzgerald, a colleague of mine, and then the family on the right was the family that I was caring for. And yet, the, and yet there was no known relationship between the two. So we went back, and so this is where genetics really integrates and one-on-one -on -one talking with um, patients. We went back to the family on the right. She had a great aunt who had saved an old Bible and we copied all the names down of the relative. The family on the left had put actually all their genealogic information on the web. And it was one of those eureka moments, late at night, we're just comparing the names. And what do you know? They share the same great-grandmother. And so that explained why they had the same exact rare variant. Everyone colored in pink or red have some form of lung disease or, or pulmonary fibrosis. And so even though they had no knowledge of each other, this variant was co-segregating with disease across space and across time. And these families live about 100 miles away from each other. They're both Texas families. They still don't have any information about each other because of HIPAA, um, and yet they're linked to this common rare variant. Not shown here is that of those that are living, only about half of those who have this rare variant have some self-described pulmonary fibrosis. They've not all been screened for subclinical disease, but it shows how complex the disease is because it's not just the inheritance of the rare variant that gives rise to the pulmonary fibrosis. There's other factors. It's environment, it's other genetic factors. That family on the right was a big Texas chicken farming family not just enthusiasts that had a backyard coop, but these are people who were raising a quarter million plus chickens. And so clearly a fibrogenic exposure going on in those individuals. So this is a complex disease that occurs later on in life. And so all the genes are, are linked together in a common pathway. There are three genes that consistently come up when people without a family history, so-called sporadic IPF, um, are screened, these are, thing, these are the genes that come up consistently, and they all can be linked to either a decrease in telomerase function or a decrease in protecting the ends of the chromosomes or the telomeres. And, and um, 
assays looking at telomerase function have shown that carriers have shorter telomere lengths, even though there is overlap with these individuals with normal populations. So this is not the, the pediatric disease, dyskeratosis congenita, which was the prototype of a telomere-related disorder. There's overlap in the older population instead of a separation of telomere length. And there's overlap in phenotypes. For TERT families, we found that there's premature graying as well as some macrocytosis. There's not a lot of frank aplastic anemia or um, bone marrow failure, but we do see evidence of macrocytosis. So the way that we see it is that basically using the familial kindreds, those that triangle on the right, even though they're extremely rare population, um, this group of patients has really led to a lot of insights in the genetics of pulmonary fibrosis. If you compare the familial kindreds on the right to the normal population, we'll use a cutoff of telomere lengths at the 10th percentile. So 10% of the normal populations have a length that's shorter than that, and yet the familial kindreds, 50% of them have a length that's shorter than the 10th percentile, and we find about half of them can be explained now by mutations um, in the genes I was telling you about. The group without a family history, IPF, lands right in the middle. And cohort by cohort, there's different numbers in terms of the degree of telomere shortening from 20% to 60% in each individual different IPF cohort. But now over across the world, there's 10 independent IPF cohorts that have been associated with telomere shortening. And in those groups, uh, slightly less than 10% can be associated with qualifying rare variants. So what does that mean? That means that from the genetics that you're born with, in some people that there, is, there are heterozygous rare variants that lead to a decrease in telomerase activity. In, in a study that I won't have time to describe, we actually found that about 5% of those individuals, there's the acquisition, so a second hit, that gives rise to a driver TERP promoter mutation, which increases telomerase activity. So in, the, in our population of older individuals, there's like there's real world evolution of a balance between telomerase deficiency versus telomerase activation. And at least for those 5% of people, that increase of telomerase appears to be safe, appears not to be linked with blood cancers, and appears just to be sufficient to balance the deficiency. So we see in this patient population the balance between senescence and cancer. So what does that mean? What I've told you so far is the genetics points to the fact that the telomerase activity and telomere length are very central to the pathogenesis of this disease. Um, and what we found, again, because we're working with patient DNA, is that the findings here are directly translatable back to patients. And we've used a biomarker, not a, not a beautiful biomarker, a messy biomarker, to investigate what, how relevant is this pathway to patients. Um, and so the first thing that we used is looking at telomere length to see how does it associate with survival. And this is the cohort we have collected and studied from UT Southwestern in Dallas. And we showed that there was a stepwise direct correlation. The shorter your telomere lengths, the faster your progression and worse survival. The longer your telomere lengths, the more stable your disease was. And through collaborations with Emory Noth, and with Hal Collard and Paul Walters at UCSF, we found this replicated in independent cohorts as small as here, this, the San Francisco cohort was less than 50 people, yet we saw the same thing. Um, work done by Dr. Chad Newton, who's, who's in the audience, who was a former fellow and trainee of mine who now runs his own independent lab, has shown that telomere lengths are, are correlating with the rate of progression of disease. And it's statistically significant for IPF as well as other subtypes of fibrotic uh, interstitial lung disease, including connective tissue disease associated with interstitial lung disease, and IPAF, which I hear we're going to have a pro-con debate about IPAF tomorrow. But telomere length could effectively split the progression of uh, IPAF cohort across three independent sites into patients that either had a very rapid progression, mirroring IPF, versus those with slow progression, mirroring CTD, ILD. It's associated with transplant outcomes and survival after transplant. It's associated with the rate of CLAD, or chronic lung allograft dysfunction, after lung transplant. I think there's real biology there that needs to be investigated. 
And finally, Dr. Newton recently looked at one of the classic studies, the Panther study, to try to investigate what caused the increased mortality that was seen in that 2012 study. Why was there more adverse effects in that patient group that, had the, that were exposed to immunosuppression plus NAC versus placebo? Could he explain it using this biomarker? And so through help of Dr. Noth, as well as all the clinical data on the BioLink, he basically looked at those patient samples, segregated those into telomer, those with short telomeres versus longer telomeres, and could see in terms of the panel on the left that most of the adverse effects were shown in the, tel in the group with short telomeres exposed to medication versus on the right, the curves were superimposable. So explained, at least molecularly, we, we, we um, hypothesized the findings of the Panther study, as well as the adverse effect of its exposure could be uh, linked attributable to inherent genetic cause. So what are the best treatments? And this is the only data that I found that's published. I don't know of others in terms of patients with short telomeres. Uh, the Genentech group, Dressen et al. in 2018 showed that their medication um, showed less progression for those with short or long telomere lengths um, in terms of decreasing progression. So what I briefly um, showed you is that how the genetic variants confer an increased susceptibility to an age-associated disease, and that the messy biomarker of telomere length um, can be used to molecularly endotype patients in terms of several relevant characteristics. So, and with that, I want to thank all the patients and families I've been getting a lot of hugs uh, since yesterday. It's great to see you guys here, as well as long standing collaborations uh, with the UT Southwestern ILD care team, Tion Barbera being the heart and soul of that organization, and now my new colleagues at Columbia, and with Nina Patel being the, the, the clinical driver of that program. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>